Okay, so remember that in the 17th century, during this age of science and the modern outlook on things, the guiding question really is what can the human mind know? We saw in Descartes that first, according to him, there is a distinction between mind and body, the inner and the outer, and that somehow what is outer or the external world gets known by the mind. But because, according to Descartes, mind and body or material and mental substance are two radically different kinds of stuff, then mind is cut off from the bodily or material world. And so my access to that world is indirect. Okay. So we've been dealing with this representational model where mind comes to know body, but indirectly. Bodies somehow transmit a picture of themselves to the mind. And this is why for Descartes, the existence of God as a non-deceiver was so crucial, because I need to have confidence that God has created me in such a way that if I use my faculties correctly, I can get a relatively accurate picture of the way the world exists in itself. And the idea of things in themselves now is going to become very important, especially as we approach Immanuel Kant. What we want to know, certainly, is how does the world exist in itself? <clears throat> but because that world is substantial, because it is comprised of material substances, it exists completely on its own. It is independent of my mind. Okay. So I need some strategy for closing the distance between what I think and what is the case in order to achieve knowledge. And Descartes' criteria for knowledge were clarity and distinctness. Okay. Descartes' legacy is the mind-body problem. And we saw that the mind-body problem is a problem of interaction, both at the epistemological level, in terms of how can I know the way things are in themselves, when what I possess of those things are merely ideas or representations. And at the metaphysical level, the mind-body problem because, becomes the difficulty of explaining how mental events, like my will to raise my arm up into the air, translates into an actual physical event. Okay? A number of ingenious solutions to this mind-body problem have been suggested, one of which we're going to see in Barclay next time, who suggests that, in fact, there is no such thing as material substance, that the world is just an idea. The only things which exist are minds and their ideas. And so there is no dualism to overcome. Okay? The world is just my idea of it. But we're not there yet. 
Okay? What we want to do is establish the basic difference between the rationalist conception of things from the empiricist conception of things. As we've seen, the three major players in the rationalist tradition are Descartes, of course, Spinoza, and Leibniz. Likewise, in the empiricist tradition, there are three major players, John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume. And by the time we get to our consideration of Hume, we will find ourselves back in skepticism, what Descartes was attempting to overcome, namely the view that knowledge is simply not possible. And all of this is in preparation for our consideration of Immanuel Kant, who is going to show us how, indeed, knowledge of the world is possible. And he does so, in a sense, by bringing together something from the rationalist side and something from the empiricist side by claiming that each one of them has a piece of the puzzle. And if we bring them together, then we can gain an insight into how knowledge is possible and what the extent of human knowledge is. So to begin our discussion of empiricism, let us contrast it to rationalism. We saw, first of all, that the basic tenet of rationalism is that knowledge is possible on the basis of reason alone, unassisted by my senses. Now again, this does not mean that all knowledge can be achieved strictly by an act of intellect. Some thinkers in the rationalist tradition, like Leibniz, think that all knowledge can be achieved through an exercise of intellect. But for now, let's just consider Descartes. Even though I would never know that the sky was blue, or that there was an earth and a moon, or even that I have a body, if it weren't for my senses, but all of those sensory pieces of knowledge ultimately depend upon or are founded upon a non-sensory basis, namely the existence of mind and the existence of God. Okay. To simplify, for the rationalists, Knowledge is possible strictly a priori because I can know from the very beginning at least two things, that I exist and that God exists and that this knowledge was not acquired through a sensory perception, which of course I could never have. I don't have a sensory perception of God nor do I have a sensory perception of myself. Okay? If you ask yourself, hey, what am I? What is the thing that thinks? We must answer that question indirectly by saying something like, well, I am the mind which stays the same throughout changes to my ideas, just like the wax as a material substance stays the same throughout changes to its appearance. Okay. All right. But for the rationalists, some knowledge is possible without ever having opened my eyes or my ears or touched anything, even though most 
worldly knowledge does depend on these senses, but the reliability of the senses requires the establishment of first principles which are non-sensory, but known strictly a priori. Okay? And this should all be reviewed to you at this point. The empiricist tradition, on the other hand, is more Aristotelian, as the rationalist tradition was more Platonic. Okay? Remember, for Plato, what is ultimately real is the good, and the good cannot be sensed. It does not belong to the visible world. So my only, my only possibility for achieving a better understanding of what is ultimately real is through an act of intellect, through the use of the Socratic dialectic, okay, which gets me ever closer to an understanding of the essence of the good. But for the empiricists, there is no such thing as a strictly a priori idea. And by strictly, I mean innate. We are not born with any ideas whatsoever. And until we have a sensory perception, the mind is like a blank sheet of paper. Okay? Now, sometimes the expression tabula rasa or blank slate is attributed to Locke although it is a much older idea, dating at least back to the 13th century in Thomas Aquinas, okay? and later adopted by the behaviorists, such as B.F. Skinner, who argue that all knowledge is nurturing as opposed to natural, okay? that we learn everything we know through our <laughs> empirical observation of the world. So one way of simplifying the basic difference between rationalism and empiricism is that the rationalists affirm the existence of a priori ideas and insist that all knowledge depends upon the a priori, whereas the empiricists affirm that all knowledge must be acquired a posteriori. That until we have a sensory stimulus, until I see or hear or touch or taste something, the mind remains an absolutely blank sheet of paper with nothing written on it. Okay. So his question becomes, where does the furniture of the mind, where do the various ideas, the countless ideas of which the mind is in possession, come from? And his answer is experience. And experience here should be understood as meaning sensory perception. Because when we get to Kant, we'll see that experience means something more than just sensory experience. For Kant, sensory experience must be synthesized with something provided a priori by the mind. So again, in Kant, we find a sort of marriage of the empiricists and the rationalists. Okay. So further, while for the rationalists, knowledge is possible on the basis of reason alone, sans sense perception, or without the benefit of any sensory perception, for the empiricists, 
all knowledge must originate in the senses. Okay? Now, I choose my wording very carefully here when I say that all knowledge must originate in the senses. Because as we see from our reading in Locke, For John Locke, there are two fountains of ideas. One of them, of course, is sensation, sensory stimulus. Okay. But once I have the benefit of a sensory perception. Once I see the desk, once I smell a fragrance or feel an object, then the mind also has the power of reflecting upon those ideas and achieving deeper insight into those ideas. So for example, we can imagine that if the empiricists are right, the first time that Pythagoras experienced a right triangle, okay. that sensation in itself did not furnish his mind with the idea of the Pythagorean theorem which states that the square of the hypotenuse, or the longest side of the triangle, is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two legs. He arrives at that formula, which he realizes is an essential aspect of this particular shape, but only by reflecting upon it. And by reflection, we mean analysis. Okay? Now, before I go any further, I'd like to further exemplify this idea between sensation and reflection by re making reference back to something that Leibniz taught, the rationalist. Okay? We didn't go into this in any detail, but I think it could be helpful now. Leibniz draws a basic distinction between what he calls two types of judgment. And understand, what I mean by judgment is any proposition I make about the world. If I say that the chair is blue, or the cat is on the mat, or a triangle has three angles, these are all judgments, because I am asserting something of some idea. And Leibniz says that there are two types of judgment we can make. There are what he calls analytic judgments, and there are what he calls synthetic judgments. And Immanuel Kant is going to begin his excursion into his critical philosophy, as we call it, by beginning with this, this distinction. So what is the difference between an analytic judgment and a synthetic judgment? Does anybody have any idea? Yeah. The analytic judgment is when um, the subject or argument is contained in predicate, or is it that way? The other way around. The predicate is contained within right. the concept of the subject, and the, and the synthetic judgment is when um, the predicate adds an essential, a non-essential property. Non property to the subject. Right. So it sounds like we've been over this. This is the lecture. Program. Okay. Thank you. So let's begin by saying this. What does it mean to analyze something? 
If I give you an idea, if I say, all right, I want you to imagine a circle and analyze it, what are you going to do? Study it. Study it. You're going to break it up into its various components. To analyze means to take something apart. Okay? To synthesize, on the other hand, means to bring things together. Okay? So we may talk about synthetic materials, in which case we have taken basic elements and combined them to form new kinds of things. So an example of an analytic judgment let's say is the triangle equals 180 degrees. That's an analytic judgment because once I have the sensation of a triangle, then through the powers of reflection, I can deduce the necessary properties belonging to that triangle simply by analyzing the relationship between its angles. Okay? So through an analysis of a triangle, Pythagoras can come up with his Pythagorean theorem. Okay? But if I were to say that the triangle is blue, that would be an example of a synthetic judgment because I am synthesizing or bringing together the concept of the triangle with the predicate of being blue. I could never know that a particular triangle was blue without using my senses. Okay? However, I can make the inference that a triangle must have three sides simply based on an analysis of the concept of a triangle. Just like if I say the bachelor is unmarried. That is an analytic judgment because if you understand the meaning of the term bachelor, all you need to do is to dissect it and realize that a bachelor is an unmarried man. So if I tell you that the bachelor next door to me is unmarried, redundant. that it is redundant. And provided that you do not suspect me of lying to you, you can, through an analysis of the concept of a bachelor, infer that my next door neighbor is also unmarried and is a man. That's an analytic judgment. Okay? I am simply analyzing what is already contained in the concept of the subject. Okay? But when I say that the bachelor next door to me is six feet tall, that is not an analytic judgment. Because no matter how long you think about the concept of a bachelor, you would never come up with six feet tall. The only way to know that is to observe it and then to synthesize the predicate of six feet with the concept of bachelor. Okay? Now let me point out something interesting that Kant will again iterate when we get there. The negation of an analytic judgment is always a contradiction because what I'm doing is denying that some essential property of the triangle belongs to it. So if I were to say the triangle does not contain 180 degrees, I've contradicted myself. Okay? It is not possible for me to conceive of a triangle 
as having any more or less than 180 degrees. However, there is no contradiction in my negating the synthetic judgment that the triangle is blue, because I could just as easily imagine that the triangle be red. Okay? So the negation of an analytic judgment is always a contradiction whereas the negation of a synthetic judgment is a possibility. Okay? And what Leibniz then goes on to say is that despite the fact that our world may seem laden with all kinds of suffering and bad design, okay, Leibniz will argue that it is so only from our finite, limited perspective. But if we were able to have a God's eye perspective on things, perhaps we could realize that this arrangement of possibilities, as they are in the world right now, is the best of all possible scenarios. Okay? For example, it is better that there should be a world in which there are free human beings and the possibility of evil than a world in which there is no possibility of evil but also no freedom. Okay? So Leibniz says, look, there are perhaps an infinite number of possible worlds like I can imagine the world to be exactly the way it is right now with the exception that the lights in this room at this moment are off. And that would be another possible world. It's a possible world because there's no contradiction in supposing the lights to be off in this room. And with every little alteration that you might make to the way the world happens to exist right now, you have established another possible world. The question arises, why then did God opt for this world the way it is right now? And his answer is, as the infinitely perfect creator, God knows which of the possible worlds is the best of all possible worlds. Is this suggesting that you're less free, in a sense? Like, we're all perfect and we have one perfect world, so there's no freedom? Well, we're not saying that this is a perfect world. We're saying it's the best of all possible worlds. No, I know, but it, and the idea that, that we do live in freedom and if we didn't... Right. A, a world in which human beings <laughs> were not free would be a worse possibility than a world in which we are free, but of course, one corollary of freedom is the possibility of evil. Okay? All right. So let's return now to John Locke. And I've asked you to read from his Essay Concerning Human Understanding, Book 2, Chapter 1, Sections 1 through 5, and Chapter 8 in its entirety, which is like 25 sections. Because I find that this is a very good statement of his position. All right? So let's see if I can make reference here to some of the text. Like, for example, Book 2, Chapter 1, which is called Of Ideas in General, and they're original. And you notice from your reading, or will notice from your reading when you do it, that the first sentence in each section of Locke is grammatically poor, okay? 
is not really a sentence. He is just describing what he intends to do in that section. So, for example, chapter 1, section 1, he writes, idea is the object of thinking. So, whatever you are aware of counts as an idea. Okay? Every man begins... Excuse me, every man being conscious to himself that he thinks and that which his mind is applied about whilst thinking being the ideas that are there, it is past doubt that men have in their minds several ideas. Of course we do. We all have countless ideas, okay. such as those expressed by the words whiteness, Hardness, sweetness, thinking, motion, man, elephant, army, drunkenness, and others. It is in the first place then to be inquired how he comes by them. Where do we receive our various ideas like hardness, whiteness, powderiness, yellow, tall, short? Okay. Now in the second paragraph... He takes aim at Descartes. He says, I know it is a received doctrine that men have native ideas and original characters stamped upon their minds in their very first being. And isn't that just what Descartes was saying when he says that we are born with the idea of ourselves and the idea of God? Okay? This opinion... I have at large examined already, and I suppose what I have said in the foregoing book will be much more easily admitted when I have shown whence the understanding may get all the ideas it has, and by what ways and degrees they may come into mind, for which I shall appear, appeal to everyone's own observation and experience. Now what follows in the second section here is one of his most famous illustrations where he says all ideas come from sensation or reflection. Let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. So where do we get the ideas we have? And his answer is going to be either through sensation or reflection upon those sensations and upon the operations of our own mind. Now, as he continues and into chapter 8, he's going to draw a distinction between the ideas belonging to the mind and the qualities belonging to things which are responsible for giving rise to those ideas in us. And in the process of doing so, draws a distinction between primary qualities and secondary qualities. Okay? So what I want you to do when you're catching up on your reading is try to understand the difference between the primary and secondary qualities, which he sometimes calls powers of a thing to produce ideas in us, and the ideas that we possess as a result of the causal power of those things that exist in the world. Okay? And it wouldn't hurt you to begin reading the Barclay, because it won't take us the whole period on Thursday to finish the lock and make our way into the Barclay, okay? For now, just put off any quiz that might appear on the calendar until next week. We'll have a quiz next week. Next week, not this week, not Thursday, okay?